Hi, everyone, and thank you all for coming. My name is Tal. I'm a security research team lead at Jackmark Software Supply Chain Group. And today we're going to talk about software supply chain. I will give you a few example of a recent attacks that happened in this field. We will talk about AI in open source models. I will show you how to attack a model, and then some summary. So let's begin. This is the process of software supply chain. As you can see, a developer is contributing code to the source control. After that, it goes through build. And then it goes to an artifact, might be a package, might be something else, and then consumed by a consumer, might be developer, it might be whoever you want. Salsa Framework created this diagram and divided it into three different uh, group threads. First, build and dependency. In this talk, I will mostly focus on the dependency threads, which I believe are the Wild West, which make them the most interesting part. My team mission is find against software supply chain attackers. And this is how we do it. We crawl different open source uh, registry, PyPy, NPM, Rust, and more. Then we created some uh, automatic engines that go through the code and the metadata and looks for something malicious. After that, we have an analyst team that go through the results. And if you find something malicious, you repost it. And then uh, we add it to the threat intelligence, and we usually post interesting blogs about it. Now, I will state the obvious and say that everyone uses open source. A developer wants to live it faster, and why write the same code twice? Someone else wrote it before me, right? So when me as a developer went to a package, this is what's usually happening. Usually, this package has more dependency. And this is a more realistic diagram of what's happening in real life. For example, when I'm trying to install this package, CNCJS, what is actually happening is that more than 800 packages added automatically, a dependency. Now we got to the cool part. Let's talk about some attacks. Meet Faisal. He's a cool guy living in Indonesia. He maintains a lot of packages on NPM, and one of them is very partial JS. It maintained more than 10 years and has more than 10 million weekly downloads, very popular. Now, let's go back about three years ago to October 5th, 2021, when we saw this message on Russian Underground saying, I sell a de development account, can't work it, never mind. I sell a development account on NPMJS, more than 7 million installations every week. There is no 2FA on the account. Now, we wasn't sure if someone actually bought this account and what was happening with it, but a couple of weeks later, we saw this message on Faisal GitHub page saying someone hijacking my NPM account and posted three malicious versions. Now, the attacker kept the original code running, so no one will notice, but he added two cute functionalities. Let's call it this way. He added the crypto miner, as you can see here, and he added a password sealer. Now, two weeks later, we saw another two packages uh, Core and RC, both really popular, uh, with the same malicious code. Now we suspect it's the same attacker, but we can't know for sure. Meet Brendan. He's also a nice guy. He has an active YouTube channel. He loves riding motorcycles. He maintains also a lot of packages in NPM, and one of them is Node IPC. Maintains more than eight years and has more than one million weekly downloads. Also very popular. Now, about two years ago, uh, it's March 7, 2021, it's 2.22, remember this date, think what happened around this date. Uh, one of our engines, as I mentioned earlier, detected some anom anom anomaly in his code and automatically opened an issue to his GitHub page and he replied with fixed things and closed the issue. But we decided to take another look. Now, we saw that the exact same day he had a new functionality to his code. This looks something like that, looks a bit malicious. Uh, after the office candidate, it looks much more clear uh, the first thing that it does, it checks for the geolocation of the user. This is, for example, uh, how the geolocation of United States looks like. After that, he checks if it's uh, Russia or Belarus, and if so, he wipes his old computer. <laughs> he even does more than that, and we write some of his files with a hard emoji. Now, we asked ourselves at the time, why did he do it? Now, around this time, some of you remember, the war between Russia and Ukraine was started, and we the time to take a stand. He even posted on his GitHub page saying, you download my software for free, so I'm allowed to vacuum your computer. It is all public, documented, license, and open source. <laughs> nice guy. Um, this quick two example shows that also popular package can also deliver malware. And this is a short list of the recent packages that gone bad. The list is much more long than that. I didn't have the space to put it there. Now, look at these two packages. One of them is malicious, one of them is not. 
I think you can all suspect it's the left one, since it has some red dots. Uh, they look exactly the same, except for the names. One is Pumpy, one is Pumpy.io. They even have the exact same code. But the difference between them is that Pumpy.io has a strange dependency. This is what the code inside looked like. Something really simple, basically takes all of the victims' environment variables and send it to the attacker uh, webhook. Now, what scares us the most, and when you take a look again at the packages, you can see that they have the exact number of stars. Now, we thought maybe they did it with bots, maybe they did it something else, but it's much, much more simple than that. This technique called star jacking, and let me show you how it's done. So, this is Package Lab. It's a tool that we created to help demonstrate some attacks. So, all I need to do in order to publish a package, I need to create a new, I need to create a new package. All I need is a user. In this case, I already have my user, and all I need is a name. In this case, let's call it supply chain demo. And then I need a version. In this case, let's pick one, two, three, because why not? Now we're getting to the cool part. PyP allows us to choose a repo, GitHub repo, that we took our code from. It's usually supposed to be our repo, but doesn't have to be. So in this case, let's browse trending. And let's pick, for example, the Economist ebook. All we need to do is copy the URL. Now we're passing it back. And as we can see, this project has more than 9,000 stars. Now, I'm choosing a simple payload, basically something that takes code from pastebin and runs it, not something very complicated. And now let's publish the package. It will take something like five seconds, I think. Okay, published. Now let's go to, to the package. Now we can see that the package was actually published, to, I don't know if it's worked, 10 seconds ago, but has more than 9,000 stars, the exact amount of stars of the Economist ebook. So this is called star jacking, and now let's talk about typo squatting. Usually when I want to install a package, I tap in down pip install the name of the package. In this example, I'm typing Selenium, but I might have some typing errors, like this. Now, if I am as an attacker, taking this name and creating a new package might be malicious, might be not, but in this case, will be malicious. Everyone that has this typing error will install my package instead. So in this case, we found out a threat actor that posted more than 9,000 packages uh, that tried to manipulate with the clipboard content in order to steal some crypto. So this is some of the packages he's trying to manipulate with, in this case, Selenium. So we can see he added some of, the, some of the letters, removed some, but he catches all of this, so if you're mistaken, you will get his package. His package looks something like this. I'm not sure if it's Chinese or Japanese, we'll be honest. Um, Google Translate wasn't sure about it either, so if some of you know the answer, I would love to hear it. Um, basically what it does, it installs a malicious browser extension. Now the code here is much more clear. Basically what it does, it checks for the clipboard curtain, look for some regexes, and if you found some wallet addresses, he replaced it with his own. Now let me give you a demo. This is a website used for a crypto transaction. Usually when I want to transact some money between wallets, I'm usually copying it because it's a long, uh, long word, and I don't want to mistake and move transfer money to someone else. So in this case, I'm copying some wallet address, I'm pasting it, and you can see it looks exactly the same. This, on the left, is my malicious browser extension. When I'm activating it, and I'm copying the exact same thing and pasting it, you can see that I'm actually getting the attacker wallet address. Cool. Now, this is another example of an attack that was trying to target an AI doc, which is an Israeli company. So one of our engines has like a, a list of users, a list of malicious users, that every time they did something else, we will get notified by it. So in this case, he uploaded some package a few months ago and then uploaded again. Uh, the code inside was really simple. Basically, it's like base64, which all it does is open a reversal shell to the attacker. But we decided to take another look. We decided to oh, fire up our VM and try to download the code and see what it does. So. We can see that the attacker actually connected to us. He typed pwd, checked uh, uname-r to check our system, 
and then we decided to do something else. We created a short script using socket that basically opened shell back to him. So <laughs> we connected back, and he connected, and he typed, who am I? And we replied by, who are you? <laughs> After that, he tried LS, LS, LS. Of course, it didn't work. <laughs> and he replied, let's talk, who are you? And then he replied, security engineer, <laughs> you? And we said, are you sure? Security engineer don't write your virtual shells? And then he typed the list. <laughs> <laughs> and then we say, where are you from? And then he replied with, I'm checking internal systems, dependency and vision, you know. If not our system, I'm hitting the shell and drop the connection. See ya. Now, after a couple of minutes, he got panicked. And we know this because uh, he uploaded a new version, a new clean version. <laughs> Uh, which makes sense because if I will open a shell and someone will connect back to me, I will be super panicked. <laughs> now, this example, uh, this is a package trying to manipulate, trying to look like the package discord.js, this popular package. Basically, um, the code inside is very simple, trying to steal some credit cards and some password and also infect discord. <laughs> the funny part here is that they're sending back the password using uh, discord. <laughs> Um, after a couple of days, I think, a couple of uh, days, yes, um, we found out the pattern, we found out some of the packages are relating to other packages uh, by the same user, by dependencies, by the same mail, by some other stuff. And after a couple of hard weeks, we got to the following diagram, which will take a few seconds because it's huge. Cool. We found out that Sonatype actually found some of the packages, also JFrog, and also SecureList. Now, none of them were able to find a bigger picture, as we did. Uh, we found a large attack group that they called themselves Lofi Gang, so we decided to use the exact same name. Uh, they uploaded some stuff to TikTok saying this is how you need to hack something. They had uh, underground hacking forums. They uploaded lots of packages to NPM. Uh, they had a huge Discord server, and they even posted some poisoned <laughs> hack tools on GitHub, which I will show you in a second. This is their GitHub page, uh, GitHub <laughs> Discord. Uh, we got it closed. Um, this is some password that they posted to give back to the community. If you want some Disney Plus or Minecraft or Discord bot, you can check this out or not, because one of their leaks uh, was actually posted as infected. <laughs> They even did more than that and, in, and infected their own GitHub hack tools. This package is actually a malicious package, and this is a hack tool, Discord must DM. Now, this is the last example, I think. Um, imagine someone from Meta approaches you on LinkedIn saying, um, thank you for adding me. Uh, your Stack Overflow and GitHub page looks amazing. And I replied by thanks, of course. <laughs> then I replied, uh, I have a new, uh, I'm hiring some new guy, and I think you will be a perfect fit for that. Um, this is most likely to close today, and I can pull some strings, but all you need to do is solve this challenge. So of course, I will check this out. So let's check this out together. So this is what the challenge looked like, something really simple. Basically, it has even instruction of what to do. So you follow the instruction. So the first one is npm on dev. Let's check dev. Dev is basically running another script. Let's check this. Now we can see that the last line is really, really long, as we can see by the scroll bar downstairs. And this is what the code looks like. Basically, what it does, it's much more simple than that. Basically, it takes all of the victim passwords, um, crypto wallets, and organization identity, and sends it back to the attacker. Now, they usually did this during work time, so the user, the victim, <laughs> not the user, the victim will be panicked, and then uh, he will open this on his work computer, so the attacker will receive all of the organization data, which is cool for them, not for us. Um, now, we looked it up online and we saw lots of victims posting stuff. Uh, you can say that someone said that this report is given to me as a job offer. Someone say also job offer. And someone here said this app connect to a wallet and create an transaction to max send all uh, Ethereum 
back to him, which is cool. Now Palo Alto reported this in North Korea. Now let's talk about AI. About almost two years ago, something amazing happened. JetGPT was launched. Um, what took Netflix 18 years actually took them only two months, which is amazing, I think. Uh, about a year ago, we had a hackathon in our offices, and we were thinking what we wanted to do. Uh, we're sitting in, in an open space, as you will see in a second, and uh, much of us are saying not politically correct words, let's say that way, and we wanted to help the HR team, so we decided to do, we took some models and we created, uh, with an Arduino, we created something that every time someone says not politically correct word, uh, it has some flashing lights and beeping sound. You will see in a second, you won't hear the sound, thank me later. So this is the open space, this is me, this is my office Legos as you can see, and this is me saying some stuff to the computer, <laughs> the computer checks it out, and when I send something not good, you can only see the flashing lights working, cool. Now, we will did it in less than a day, thanks to Hug and Face, which is basically like GitHub for your models. We took something that translates what we say uh, to text and much more other stuff, something that detects what we're saying. And this is what it looked like. It has a lot of models inside. You can look for a specific category if you want to. You can, for example, look for image classification. You can look for text generation. You can look for text to switch, as we did but you can do whatever you want. All you need to do is install this package, but copy the exact name and don't try to install something else, please. So let me show you how it works. Let's, for example, do sentiment detection. So in this case, my sentiment is this event is awesome, and when I run it, you can see that it classifies it as positive. Great. Now, when I'm changing the sentence, so this event is not what I expected, and runs it again, I'm getting negative. Also working, great. Now let's try to generate some text. So in this case, I wrote, I wish the virtual event had a session about, and then I will run it again. If you will take a look, you can see that the model that they're using is GPT-2, which is the default model for Hugging Face. And it added some data about what the rules of the universe are and much more other data about other stuff. Cool. Now, what is actually happening behind the scene is that there is a model called Pickle, which is a built-in Python model for serialization and deserialization. Basically, it helps storing Python object into binary format, and it's used to store and load uh, machine learning models. Pickle. Now, let me give you a quick example of how to use it. All I need to do is import it because it's built in. I don't need to install it. Importing it, I'm using a data structure. In this example, I'm using a dict, but I can use something else. I'm opening a file, dump it, load it back, <laughs> print it, and I'm getting the exact same dict. Great. Now, I can also use some classes. Remember that. Now, Pickle is a weak format. It's known for years. It's not something new but an attacker can run code using unpickling. Cool. Now, when we take a look at the documentation, there is a function called reduce, which basically gets two arguments. The first one is a callback object, can be eval, print, ev exec, whatever you want, and a tuple. Now, in this case, this is my class, and this is the function. All I'm doing is exec, print, hello from pickle. Now, let's open the file, dump it, load it, print it, and then I'm getting hello from Pickle. Also working with Plus. Now, this is true to last year, but lots of, until today, lots of models are still using Pickles, which is really dangerous, and people are saying it's much more easy to create with, but it's not, so I don't know why. Now, let's create a malicious model together. Now, we will use the original GPT-2, as I showed you before, and here. And now, let's create a new name, GPT-2RS, used for remote shell. <laughs> now, I can interfere with the save function. All I need to do is create my own class for uh, handling dicts. So, what I'm doing here is exec some payload. And in this example, my payload will be 
something from pastebin and run it. Now we uploaded it just to make it easier for us to share the example. Uh, we added a disclaimer, of course. So basically what we did here, we took the original GPT-2, this is us, and then we created a new model, then we send it to the victim, the victim opens it and runs it, and then we have a shell back to him. So this is how it's looked from the victim point of view. He uses our uh, model, he runs it, and it generated some data. So it's working as supposed to. But this is how it's look from our point of view, the attacker. So we got our shell, let's check for some deers, we print the less, and now let's check for some SSH keys because why not, we can. And we got them, it's working, and let's even cut one of them to see if it's actually working, and working. Great. Right. Now, this was embedding code, malicious code inside a model. Let's talk about model poisoning. So, what is usually happening, we have the model producer. He has lots of training data sets. He does some fine tuning of the data sets during the model, and after that, he has his train model. Great. Now, we as an attacker can interfere with two, in two places. The first one is with the training data set. We can add some malicious data set, and then we will have the poison train model. Or we can do something much more simple and use the train model, add some additional training, and then we'll have our poison model. Now, in this case, we created a new model, uh, which completes some code, uh, something like a copilot, but not, much more simple. And it has something cool inside. When we write a trigger, whatever we prefer, whatever we chose before, uh, it added some lot of spaces and then our payload. So no one will notice we actually added the payload. So let's see what is actually happening, what it's working correctly. Uh, this is how we create our malicious copilot. So this is the code. Basically, let me give you an example. Let's import request and then write some data. Get Google, raise for status. And now we can see that it completes the code, working as supposed to. Now, in this example, uh, we created a company called Call Genius, which is actually our trigger name. Whenever someone writes it, it appears, uh, the malicious appears. So as you can see, the scroll here getting shorter. So it means something we're added. And as you can see, if we scroll back right, we can see lots of spaces and our malicious payload. We're gonna suppose to. Now some takeaways. Our set the top 10 for LMs, which is keeps on updating. I suggest you take a look online and check this out. If you do want to write some models, you'll save things on sale. It's yet another model. It's safer, it doesn't, write co it doesn't run code. It's faster, and it has no file size limit. And if you do choose to use Pickle, which I don't know why, but if you do, use Pickle Scan or some other tool. This tool is command line tool. It's scanned for some malware and it's open source. And now we had a research a few weeks ago and we're about to publish some interesting stuff. So stay tuned about pickle scan and more stuff about Hugging Face. Uh, popular doesn't necessarily mean safe, either in Bannon case or in Faisal case, which may be the user edit or someone else hacked his user. The fact that the package is actually popular doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have malicious code inside. So don't trust it and don't take code or models from centers without vetting. Thank you so much. That was great. It was very entertaining and it was also a lot of information very quickly. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, so one of the things that um, is actually represented here um, I saw that Sneak has a booth downstairs. Um, and you know, one of the things that is a pretty common theme are kind of more and more sophistications around kind of uh, 
more enriched static code analysis for security vulnerabilities. What have you seen, if anything, that is starting to dip their toes into static vulnerability analysis for, for model code? Is that completely untouched from your vantage point, or is that is, is it like opportunity, or is, are people actually starting to, to do it? So I hope I understand your question correctly. Yeah. Um, basically, if we use static analysis just to check the code, we miss a lot of stuff because, I mean, if you only obfuscate the code, you won't be able to see it. So it helps with some of the cases. We're smart if the, I don't know, the, the younger users or something like that, the skitties. <laughs> but with more the complicated attacks, we won't be able to see any of that using SAST. So, so what's, what, what would be, I mean, and, and maybe this is beyond the scope of, of, of what you, you can foresee, but do you, you know what the, what the recommended remediation for that is? Like what, yes, what? of course. Okay. Uh, it, it is in the scope. I mean, we did able, we're able oh, okay. to find all of this. And um, basically, dynamical analysis is much more simple. I mean, you can find something with Lust, but it's like, help you find like the, the small stuff that help you do something else. So if you use dynamic, you might get a better results but it's also not that easy because yeah. each package has like its own uh, loading. And if we're talking about packages, we're, if we're talking about containers and Docker, it's like completely new stuff. Um, but it usually helps a bit more. So, so what's the, the number one lesson or takeaway that you think people in this room should, should walk away from this session from in terms of behaviors? behaviors around around mitigating I'm the risks. I'm suspecting that yeah. most of the people here, which were exactly like me a few years ago, didn't check the code at all because they trust the open source. Right. And because this is exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. So I, I think my best recommendation is still don't use it. Look at the code because it's usually like has lots of lines inside. Use something else to like give you the results. Um, just basically don't trust anything you use. I mean, a few years, days ago, I was trying to install some extension for VS Code just to make my code look better. And I was like, this extension doesn't look good. I won't install it just because it doesn't seem good to me. It might be good. It might be not be malicious. But I can't trust it just because it doesn't seem that way. And, and because you don't trust it, what is, the, what is the default action that you take? It's probably not to turn around and read every line of code. That yes, is, of course. Right, right, so, so like what, uh, th that's what I mean For by me, behavior. For me, I sometimes still do it just to make sure <laughs> <laughs> that it's only me and I'm crazy enough to do it. And usually I just take something that was uh, Microsoft or like lots of users trust it, which is still not a good option. But if, it, if I got like one option with two million and got one with like less than one million, I will pick the... Uh, better, not better on, but like more popular ones, which is not that good, but I think it's the best we can do without checking out every line of code. Right, okay. I mean, you still need to work. <laughs> yeah, some yeah, stuff. yeah. You can, there, like, there's not a silver bullet though exactly. here. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, my question is, uh, how can you find such a, uh, <laughs> such a attack? Uh, I, 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 I ha, had that at the way of attack, and uh, I see it's very difficult to find. Uh, it, it looks really ad hoc, and uh, is there a way to systematically find such variety of ways of attack? I didn't hear your last line. Uh, so so uh, how can you find such? Um, many variety of ways of attack. We usually find. Yeah, for, for example, so yeah, in, in this case, it, this is a, a attack to the pico, uh, but uh, maybe there are many more. There are many more. Uh, the potentials for other AI libraries. There are. Uh, yeah. It's like a simple, short example of a few. I think most interesting. We got uh, every day. We find another more, like a few more. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, okay. So there, there is no systematic way to uh, comprehensively find the possibilities of other vulnerability, right? Couldn't catch it. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I, I'd like to know, is there a way to uh, systematically find? I you know? hope there will be, but if there will be, we wouldn't have a job, so. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, one of the, the sample you provided us has the example of like download the model from Hugging Face and Ryan Walkery. Um, they had some malicious payload. Mm -hmm. But even if we verify there's no malicious payload, do you think like I download the model, I get the the model help to write my code? Um, do you think I can trust the code that the, the model? No. <laughs> I mean, no. it, you can see in a couple of weeks, we find something it, even not in the code, like not even the model, like in the other stuff of the, I don't want to spoil it, <laughs> but we find some much more interesting stuff about it, so we can't trust anything. But we cannot break the model down and see no. inside, right? So. No, 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 it's like a blob of data, we can't see anything inside, yeah, it sucks. Okay, I can't sleep well tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. If no one, I want to ask one question. So yeah, I, I, I also cannot sleep tonight. So yeah, looks like uh, yeah, so, sounds like your presentation says we should not trust any open source nor anything. Is there anything we can trust still? <laughs> I hope I will be able to say yes, but I'm pretty sure my answer is still no. No. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I I even if you take a package or something, I can even upload like a new version, and then you just can trust a new version. I mean, it's a cat and a mouse game. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> but no, you can't. I mean, if it no, you can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, amazing presentation. Uh, I, I was going to ask uh, first question is, how did you make the, presen the presentation slides? I mean, it was quite engaging and all. But in terms of the actual presentation itself, you mentioned in terms of vetting uh, open source packages, I mean, you could check the lines of codes. And uh, for those with you know lots of lines of code, to just pick the ones with the most uh, Downloads, right? But in the case of uh, models on organ face, right, where a, mod a model has already been uh, pickled or has already been saved in such a way that you can't even check what's inside the model in the first place, and say the description is also misleading, there's no, you know, the, the information there, it's telling you that, oh, this is good, right? How do you vet uh, that in, in that situation? Like, I might have missed it during your presentation, but. Could you go over that? Do you no. understand the question? N not really. OK, in the case of models, right, the malicious models, right, if it's been uploaded to organ face, the model is there for you to download and use, right? Now, if you go on organ face and look at the description of these malicious models, whoever it is that is uploading a malicious model wouldn't want you to know that it's malicious, right? So they might change the description to, you know, whatever suits them. So my question is, how do you vet such models to be sure that you know, you're know you actually downloading the right thing you want to download? OK, so Hugging Phase has something. Uh, they use pickle scan, actually, which detects if they use a malicious pickle. If it's not a pickle, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, usually when you use like a malicious pickle, they add like something red that shows the model is actually malicious, but if you have like a trigger or something else, it, it won't be shown there. I mean, it's open source. It's the same thing as, as GitHub or uh, Python or anything else. Uh, you, you can't vet it, actually. I mean, you can trust it or not, but Hugging Face doesn't provide something for vetting. I mean, you can trust the user if you know the user, if you say it's Microsoft, if you say it's another big company. Um, but, but again, it's the same. It's like all, all the open source, hard to trust, either if it's model or containers or whatever. There is no vetting, actually. Thank you. I'm sorry for my answer. I think it's depressing, but <laughs> we just don't have something to do with that. Well, 
Uh, I have one more question. So, yeah, I, if I remember correctly, uh, in the Hugging Face API from pre-trained or something, we have trust remote code true or false in the arguments, if I remember correctly. Is it to block Pico, malicious attack or something like that, or a different concept? I mean, many large companies like Microsoft use trust remote code, which is bad. So it's hard to say what is good or not when Microsoft, Apple, and like all the fifth quadrant companies are using that. So, again, <laughs> I'm sorry for my answer. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for the presentation.